Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all came back. Um, just uh, notice some people give me the, try to hand in the exercises to me. So I have a box outside with my name on it in English as well. So just put it in there and you know, it's easier uh, for it. I have corrected your first homework and I forgot to bring it here. So if you wait at the end of the lecture, I'll just run to my office and you can take, take it, otherwise take it next week, whatever. Most people got 100, and the people who didn't get 100 got about a 95. So the grades are good, except for one guy who didn't do have the exercise. So it's kind of his fault. But, but don't worry, grades are good. Uh, continue like that, and everything will be fine. Uh, for today, um, we're going to go over operators. We're going to talk about representations, X space, P space. Uh, we're going to talk about expectation values and the uncertainty principle. Uh, these are going to be the last. Uh, more theoretical part of this course. From next week on, we're going to be solving different systems, starting with the infinite potential well, which I think you already saw in the lecture yesterday. So next week, we're really going to get, in, going to get into the actual systems. We're going to solve quantum mechanical systems, and we'll be applying all of the principles that we have learned up till now. Uh, so if they're not making exactly sense yet, what exactly, why we learned this, what, it's, what is it for, the end of next week will become very clear. Uh, if it's not clear already, um, so, no worries, um, we'll begin. So, I'd like to start with operators. What are operators? Why do we need them? What are they for? Uh, maybe a good place to start. Um, last, last week I was asked the question, what is quantum mechanics? And I was kind of surprised by the question. I didn't quite know what to answer. Um, so, this lecture is is the answer. Uh, quantum mechanics, you can think of it as a, as a machine, as a tool uh, to make calculations. The reason we want to make calculations is in order to um, predict the outcome of an experiment. That's all, all of physics, not just quantum mechanics, also Newtonian uh, mechanics. We want to calculate how long will it take for this pen to drop to the floor. So we have a model, it's called forces, we calculate how much time it will take, then we do an experiment, then we compare. If it's good, great, if not, throw the theory away, make a new theory. So quantum mechanics is a theory that works, um, and which um, then we would like to compare to experiment. Um, but the thing is that, as you've already seen, quantum mechanics is probabilistic. We only know with a certain probability where to find a certain particle and so on. Um, so today we're gonna see what can we calculate with quantum mechanics, what can we um, um, compare to the experiment, and that's what it's all about in the end effect. So first of all, we have something called observables. An observable is any physical quantity that we can measure. So a measurable physical quantity uh, we call that an observable because it can be observed. Uh, an example for an observable, the momentum we can observe, we can measure the momentum. For example, energy, we can measure the energy uh, of a particle. So that would be an observable. Now in quantum mechanics, we associate to each observable an operator. To each observable, associate an operator. Now, we, we talked about this last week. An operator is something that acts um, on a wave function. So, for example, um, if you look at the momentum operator, momentum operator is the mathematical operator that is associated with the observable momentum. Um, so, when the so it acts on some wave function psi of x, and it is defined as minus ih bar d to the x on psi. So that's just telling you what to do mathematically. Um, it is equivalent to measuring the momentum. Now the important thing about operators is that there are, um, for every operator there are special functions called the, called the eigenfunctions. So for each An operator 
has special functions. They satisfy the equation I'll write down in general, so some operator f, uh, which acts on one of those special functions. So when the operator act, acts on such a special function, we get a number times that same function. And for each of these functions, there is a specific number. Not many numbers, just one number. So every time it acts on the nth function, I'll get the nth number. Um, these functions are called eigenfunctions. We spoke about this already. Eigenfunctions. And these numbers are called eigenvalues. And I pointed out that eigen just means that it belongs to this operator. So for some operator, f operator, right, we have a set of eigenfunctions. Could be an infinite set, could be a finite, a finite set. Uh, and for each eigenfunction, there is one eigenvalue that belongs to that eigenfunction. Um, so for example, that's the first one we're going to solve. Um, Uh, the momentum operator. So let's solve this as an example. Uh, find the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. Find the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator. So in order to find the eigenfunctions, um, what we have to do is solve an equation, right? We need to find the equation that satisfies that when the operator acts on the function, and I'm going to use an index p instead of n, come clear, because the momentum, right? That's what I'm symbolizing by p, and needs to be equal to the eigenvalue, which is the momentum on x. So when, when the momentum operator acts on an eigenfunction, you get a number which is exactly the momentum, because it's the momentum operator. Right? That's what I'm measuring. That's the observable um, times that same eigenfunction. So we're going to solve this equation. In order to solve the equation, it's very simple. We just plug in um, the operator in its explicit form. Um, we can separate the variables and solve the differential equation. So we get d phi over phi uh, p dx, right? So this is a logarithm. And we find that phi index p of x equals some integration constant e to the i k x, e to the i p over h bar, sorry. Should I kill myself? P over h bar, right? We divide by minus i h bar. So these are the eigenfunctions, right? That satisfy this equation. We can check that. Right? When p operator acts on by p of x, then what we have to do, right, is minus i h bar d dx, that's the operator, acting on this. So when we take the derivative, we take down an i times p divided by h bar. So the h bar disappears, the i and the minus i just give 1. I'm left with p. So we'll get p times the function. And now this is exactly phi p. That's the function we started off with. So you see that the eigenvalue equation is satisfied by this function. It's exactly what it does. Obviously, this solution obviously makes sense, but just to point out once more, right? You take the derivative, you apply the operator, you get the momentum. So measuring, right? If I go to my lab, take a particle, and I, and I measure its momentum, if I use a pen and a, and a paper, and I will do it on, on the paper, what I have to do is apply the operator. So measuring the quantity in the lab is equivalent to applying the operator to the wave function. That's what it means. Uh, we can go one step further. We can insert uh, the relation p equals h bar k. Um, then we can write 
the eigenfunctions as e to the ikx. We saw those last time already. They're also the eigenfunctions of the free particle. Uh, we saw that last week. Uh, I also switched to index k uh, instead of p because I'm now using k, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, so that's just dummy variable. I could call it whatever I want. Um, right. Uh, so the next step will be questions up to here? No. So the next step will be uh, finding A, right? There's still some integration constant. Um, and for this, we use a, uh, a convention. It's not something that has to be this way, but it's a convention. We would like um, all eigenfunctions to be normalized. Normalization. We would like all eigenfunctions to be normalized. Now, normalized means, and it might not be a very good first example, but this function is a little bit weird uh, because it can be normalized. Take a look at, right, look at phi k of x, absolute value squared, integral from minus infinity to infinity dx. This diverges, right? Because the the absolute value which is 1 or, or a squared and then integral over infinite space it diverges so these functions can't actually be normalized so this is subtlety uh, it happens very rarely in quantum mechanics here it happens uh, and what we do, how do we solve the problem we normalize to a delta function normalize to a Dirac delta so we, uh, we would like that the inner product of phi k and some other phi k, called phi k prime, has to be equal to a Dirac delta. So either it's zero or it's something that diverges if k equals k prime. And using this, right, this is the, the Dirac normalization, we only use in, in cases that this diverges. Uh, we can use that to find A. Um, because if you look, right, let's just, let's just do this, right? What is phi k, phi k prime according uh, to the eigenfunctions found? So by definition, it's the integral dx of this thing absolute value, uh, the complex, complex conjugate times the, uh, the regular function, right? So a times a times a squared. We can take this together, of course, and I think you already see where I'm going with this. Take the a outside. Um, I think you see where I'm going with this, right? This has to be equal to, we want this to be equal to um, a delta function. But we know on the other hand, uh, we can write a delta function. So this, two weeks ago, I think, um, is 1 over 2 pi integral dx e to the i k prime minus k x. Right, we proved this, and we explained this. So for me, we see right away that a needs to be 1 over root 2 pi. So the bottom line is that phi k of x is 1 over root 2 pi e to the i k x. Congratulations, you have found your first eigenfunction. And we found everything. The normal constants, there's no more weird stuff. They satisfy orthogonality. They are eigenfunctions of the P operator, which we have shown. This is an eigenfunction. You're going to ha find many eigenfunctions um, as we go on. Questions? Okay, so let's talk about, we'll talk for another minute or so about the, the subscript K.
So the subsort k, the, um, right, it's phi k, so what does the k mean? So the k is something we call the quantum number. We're dealing with quantum mechanics, everything has to be quantum, right? Quantum operators and the quantum numbers, there's quantum everywhere. So we call it quantum number. Quantum number. Right, so in this case, that would be k, quantum number. Um, its, its job is to tell us which eigenfunction we're talking about. Right, you see, if you plug in a different k, you get a different function. You'll get an e to the i kx uh, with, a, with a different frequency. The k is like the, the spatial frequency of, it's like the real part of the cosine. So different k is a different function, it's a different frequency. So the k tells us which eigenfunction we're talking about. we are dealing with. Now, the quantum number also always has a physical meaning. Sometimes it will be more clear what the physical meaning is, sometimes it will be less clear. In this case, it's absolutely clear. In this case, it is um, up to a constant to momentum. So, take the quantum number, you know you're in the kth state. K okay, can be equal to 1, 2, 3, 1 1.5, 2.7, whatever. If you know you're in the 2.7th state, you know your momentum is equal to 2.7 times h bar. That's the physical meaning of, uh, of the quantum number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's only for the fun eigenfunction of the thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's so momentum. There's always a physical meaning. In the case of the momentum uh, eigenfunctions, the physical meaning of k is the momentum. A different eigenfunction for a different operator will have a different physical meaning. It will always be connected to what the operator resembles, though. Right? So the energy, we'll get to that. So momentum operator, it, it's always the same, right? It's the momentum operator, so the momentum eigenfunctions. So the, so the quantum number tells me something about the momentum. Right. It's all connected. Okay. So it's like the wave number? Well, in this case, it's exactly the wave number. Right? Because e to the i k is a plane wave, so k is the wave, is the wave number. Who has the question? So, yeah, in this case, it's exactly the wave number because a, a, an eigenfunction of the momentum operator is a free particle which is a plane wave. In, in wave theory, so it's exactly the wave number. But for a different operator, no. Hmm. It's something else. And when we get there, we'll, we'll talk about what it means. Um, okay, a uh, word or two on uncertainty. Although we're going to talk about that in length later, uh, we can introduce it here already. So let's say a few words about uncertainty. It's a very important principle. Um, we could ask the question, start at a different place. Since, right, if I'm in the k state, let's say, I, let's say we have a particle in the k state. Particle in k state. Then we know that it's, I say, the, the k0 state. Okay, k0 is some number. So if the particle in, is in the k0 state, that means that its eigenfunction, right, this is just trivial, is 1 over root 2 pi e to the i k naught x. Um, it means that the momentum is pretty to the h bar k naught. So we know the momentum uh, with absolute certainty. We, it's a definite value. We say the momentum has a definite value. Has a definite value. I'm trying to teach you the, the words we use in quantum mechanics. So in this case, uh, momentum uh, eigenstates have a definite value. Now let's ask the question of where is the particle? So how do we find out where the particle is? Position of the wave. 
good idea because I'm saying, but think back to real last time. The distribution in space is the wave function squared, right? So the density in X, right, is the wave function absolute value squared. That will tell us with what probability do I find the particle at what place, right? Spoke about the last week. So in this case, what do we get? So where's the particle? Could be anywhere. There's an equal, um, an equal chance of finding the particle anywhere in space between minus infinity and plus infinity. There is no place where it is more. Where it, if I would play the game right, guess what a particle is. Every time you guess right, you, you'll get a shekel. Um, you play for a long time. There's, there's no good place to guess. It's just random. So you see here that we have no idea, right? Um, where the where the particle is. And notice it is connected to for it's, it is connected with the momentum having a definite value. Oh, there's no red here. Okay. So definite momentum, right? Means that I have no idea where the particle is. And this is a principle. Okay. This is a principle we'll we'll get back to uh, towards the end of class. Just remember that we see here already. Questions about this? This is also true vice versa. If we know exactly where the particle is, we have no idea what its momentum is. We'll see that in a minute. Wait, I just didn't understand why the density is the sine function uh, squared. Remember that the probability is defined as the probability to be in the interval yeah, x so x plus dx, right? is, okay, psi of x squared um, dx, right? Okay. So this is the probability. I call this, I call the, the probability density, right? Because this is a density times dx, which is a length, it gives, gives the probability. So I call this for the density. Um, and since I told you that the particle is in the k0 state, you know its wave function is the eigenfunction, so instead of psi, I plug in phi. Oh, okay. okay. Other questions? Okay, let's do another example. Uh, let's talk about the position operator. So, for example, so we saw already last week that position operator just means multiplication by x. Very simple operator, very trivial, what do you have to do? Um, and what we'd like to do is find the eigenfunctions. Eigenfunctions of x operator. Um, I won't do this with mathematical rigor. I'll give a, uh, a nice argument um, that will apply what we have just learned. So we saw that the the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator have a definite momentum. Let's write down the argument. So the argument goes as follows. Eigenfunctions of P operator have definite P, definite momentum. Hence, right, the eigenfunctions of, of, uh, of X op position operator must have a definite position. X. So we're looking for a function. Okay, we're looking for a function f of x. Let's call it P. 
give the names. We're looking for a function that tells us with absolute certainty that the particle is at some position x naught. So it could be a sign. Couldn't be, right? Because the sign of x will not tell us that the particle is x naught. It's some wavy function. What function do you know? Delta. Very good. It's a delta function. So if you look at the delta function, x minus x naught, this function is zero everywhere besides for at x naught. If you apply the x operator, on the eigenfunction. So that means what you have to do is multiply x by delta x minus x naught. This was on your first homework assignment, if I remember correctly. This equals x naught. Or maybe on your homework you did with x naught equals zero. You might have done x times delta x equals zero at all points. Why is this true? This is true because if x is different than x naught, then the delta is zero. It is, it's, 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 it's supposed to be zero. So that's wrong. That's wrong with the normalization, right? It's wrong with normalization. Um, in the same way that the momentum operator, that the momentum eigenvalues cannot be normalized, also the um, position eigenvalues cannot be normalized. So let's say it's 1, and then it's times x naught. So it breaks down over here, but, it, but it's true. Does that have no, no, it's, no, no, it's continuous. But it's infinity. No, no. So it, it's kind of infinity, but kind of not. Mathematically, the delta is only defined under the integral anyway. So this doesn't really exist mathematically in that way, which I hate as well. I don't like weird functions like that. Uh, but this is the way it's done. So when, when the x operator acts on the delta, then we get x naught times delta, sorry. Don't just throw that away. Right, so we get <coughs> operator acting on function equals eigenfunction, uh, eigenvalue, sorry, equals eigenvalue acting on times eigenfunction. Um, the quantum number in this case is just x naught. So the quantum number is x naught, and of course its meaning is the position. Position at which particle is. Great. Yes, question. How will the eigen equation, the eigen value equation, will look like? this. I mean, generally, generally on some functions. For the x operator? Yes. x operator times the function equals x naught times the function. That's how, so that's... The first, lots of x's, like the x operator, which is x and x. Oh, there are too many x's. So, so... This x with no subscript is a variable. That's a variable that can take any value between minus infinity and plus infinity. x naught is the place the product is at. That's just one number. So this is an infinite amount of numbers. It's a variable. This is the, the parameter if you want. And this is an operator. Right? That, that, uh, I, was concerned, I was confused by the operator and the value being that the value being is x0 Okay, so I, does this make it clear? Yes. Sort of? A little bit? You'll get there, don't worry. It's not that. It's really difficult the first time you see this. But I, remember, I think I remember quantum is a very nice explanation on, on the... Um, yes, he has a very nice explanation on everything. But especially um, if you want to read up on, uh, on position operators, I think chapter 2 or 3, somewhere there, I you to read. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, let's talk <laughs> about something called hermeticity.
not any operator is a legal quantum operator, or not any um, operator can be associated with a um, observable. Only something we call Hermitian, I'm going to define this word in a second, operators um, can be associated with observables. What does Hermitian mean? It's a definition. So for some operator f up, it is Hermitian if it satisfies the following equation. Explain the equation. So on the one hand, you see the operator is acting on psi 1 and psi 2 are some random wave functions. Okay? Take, for example, these wave functions here. Okay. Or whatever. Some random wave function. It's true for any wave function, right? For any psi 1, 2. Uh, or for all. Right? So the uh, definition says the following. You can apply, if you can apply the operator on psi 2, and then multiply by the compass conjugate of psi 1 integrated of all space. That is equivalent to first applying the operator onto psi 1. Okay, it's like a different wave function. First apply to psi 1, then take the compass conjugate of whatever came out of it. Multiply by psi 2 integral dx. These two um, quantities, if you may, um, these two expressions, must be equal. If this is not satisfied by some operator, you cannot associate it to an observable. Make an example uh, to show this. This is a mathematical definition of homodicity. Metaphor of Hermitian matrices, like in linear algebra. You definitely heard about it. The question is do you, do you, if, whether you remember it. You definitely heard about it. It exists also for, for operators acting on continuous functions. Uh, as an example, let's find, let's prove that the momentum operator is remission. So we'll start off with the left hand side of what we have to show. We need to show that the integral from minus infinity to infinity, psi 1 squared, some random psi 1, right? Times minus i h bar d dx psi 2 dx. Great, this is what we're starting off with. That's the left hand, that's the left hand side of this equation. And now we're going to do, right, this is the p operator. What we're going to do now is integrate by parts. When I integrate by parts, right, there's, let's do one step before this, just to make it clear, maybe. Integrate by parts. So I'll take out the mi minus, I'll take out the minus ih bar in front of everything, and then I have psi star, psi 1 star, d psi 2 to dx. So when I integrate by part, I first get the integral of both functions. the boundary term, minus the integral derivative of the other function. Okay, equation by parts. That's like basics. What is this term? Why is it term zero? Right, so this is an important point. I'm going to say it out loud and stress this point. This is zero. 
and what's a zero? The wave function, right, has a probabilistic meaning. So the integral over the wave function squared needs to equal one. If you want to, if you want to have a function that the integral all, over all the space is finite, we need the, the wave function to, to go to zero at some point. This can have a finite um, area, which is the integral. Some function which is just a straight line, the area under, under this under a straight line is infinite. That was exactly the problem with the, uh, uh, with the momentum eigenhap functions, that they're not normalizable. But if we assume that the actual psi, the wave function is normalizable, then it must go to zero at infinity. In which case, when you plug in the boundary terms, it is zero. So we left only the second part. The minus kills the minus, we put in the ih bar, so we get integral minus infinity to infinity. Um, now there's ih bar d dx acting on psi 1 star times psi 2. It's acting only on the psi 1, right? dx. Or another way I can do this is I can add the star to, to the operator and add a minus before the i. So this is also equal to minus i h bar d psi 1 to the x star. Right? I just take the commas conjugate and add commas conjugate times psi 2 dx. Now what is this? This is the momentum operator acting on psi 1, whole thing star, which is this. So I started off on the left-hand side. I integrate by parts, and then write the right-hand side. So I have proven that it doesn't matter on which of the two functions I apply the momentum operator, which means that the momentum operator is remission. So now I've proven to you that the momentum operator is a legal, is a valid um, quantum operator. We can associate uh, an observable, in this case the momentum, with the operator. Questions? Perfect. Next, let's talk about representations. It's an important subject. It's an important subject. Uh, I'll talk about it briefly. It's an important subject. It's something that it's a subject that people who finish quantum mechanics, so finish the semester, do not, do not understand. So pay attention. I'll try to make it as clear as possible so we won't have problems understanding this. Um, we can talk in the one, on the one hand side. We can talk about the position space. In position space, what does that mean? That means we express all of our functions as a function of x. In this case, we have a wave function, psi of x and t, and the probability, there's nothing new, is psi of x t squared dx. Now, in can also define momentum space. Momentum space, we express all of our functions as a function of P or of K. So it could be the P space or K space. The difference is just an H bar, right? It's the same thing. It's the same variable. It's just up to a constant. It's just a scaling factor. Um, what is the difference? So if you want to find the wave function in P space, it's the Fourier transform of the wave function x space. Okay, the Fourier transform takes you from one space to the other. And once you've found um, the wave function in p space, or in k space, I want to do k, sorry. It switches to a k. Usually easier to think in k than in p. 
but of course it's just a matter of, of taste. Uh, the probability, in this case, the wave function does not tell us where the particle is, it tells us at what momentum the particle is. So the probability to be a momentum, or wave number k, momentum h bar k, is then psi tilde k t squared times dk. So now the wave function tells us at what momentum we are. Position space, the wave function tells us what position we are. It doesn't tell us anything about momentum. Do the transform Fourier. The wave function tells you what momentum you are, or certain probability, and not and tells you nothing about the about the about the position. Of course, you can switch back and forth, right? You know how to go back and forth, which is a mathematical uh, operation, which could be easy or hard, depends on your function. And this way, you can extract both information about the x space and about the k space, uh, depending on how you're working it. From this, we we can see something about, in, about the uncertainty. Um, I don't know if you've shown this already in your math class. Um, a function that is narrow, so that is small, right? It's confined in x. A function that is narrow in x. in x space is wide in k space. So we saw, for instance, last week that we take a Gaussian, right, which was something like e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared. And we did Fourier transform to that. Then we got, it's exaggerated, we got something where the sigma was upstairs, remember? I think it was 2k squared over sigma. Sorry, it was sigma k squared squared over two. Right, we did that in class. So the sigma, what is the sigma? Sigma is the width, or the width is two sigma actually. So here the six is two sigma. Sorry, it's two sigma, yeah. Here, the width will be one divided by two sigma. So if say sigma is a small number, the width here is small, then one divided by two sigma is large. Could be. So it goes like. I'm not exactly sure. I could be wrong. Um, but in any case, the important thing is the sigma, right? So something with a small sigma is 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 narrow here and wide here. If it's a large sigma, it's the opposite. And that reminds us of the uncertainty. Because here the probability to be at a certain x is very confined. You have to be in this interval. But at k space, that could be in a very large interval. So the Fourier transform and uncertainty match very well. If I'm confined in x space, I'm spread out in k space, and vice versa. Questions? OK. Solve an example. So we have found that the eigenfunctions of the momentum and the position of Fourier are the following. We have found that the eigenfunctions of the momentum operator are 1 over root 2 pi e to the i k x. And we have found, let's call this k naught, k so that for a certain K naught, the eigenfunction is e to the i k naught x, and we have found that the eigenfunctions of the position operator um, is a delta function. Now notice that these functions are in x space. Why are they in x space? Because of the, they're expressed as a function of x. Not be confused about the fact that this is the momentum um, eigenstate. It is the momentum eigenstate, but it's an x space because it's a function of x. Both these functions are in the x space because they're a function of x. Take their absolute value squared, 
it'll tell you something about where the particle is, not what its momentum is. So the exercise we'd like to solve is find these eigenfunctions in momentum space, in K space. How is this done? Fourier Very stupid, right? Fourier transform. So this is very simple. We're looking start off phi tilde k naught of k. Okay, that's why I added the k naught because you don't want to confuse with the variable k. Um, so the Fourier transform will give us one over two pi integral e to the i k naught minus k x dx. And by definition, there's a delta function. This makes absolute sense. We talked about the fact that the momentum operators, the momentum eigenfunctions, have a definite momentum. So in k-space, they're a delta function. They have a definite momentum. It's amazing right? how much sense it makes. I love it. I don't mind you guys. If we want to find the eigenfunctions of the um, position operator in k space, okay, so it's the eigenfunction to position operator, but now as a function of k, so that's k space, we take the Fourier transform of a delta. Right? What do we get? We get e to the minus i k naught x, right? Just take out, just picks out the value of this function at k equals k naught. And this also makes perfect sense because the Fourier transform of the position eigenstate, right? Take the absolute value squared. So you get that, you get the distribution in K space, right? The probability of finding a certain momentum is uniformly distributed. Why is that? Because we knew exactly what a particle was. So we know nothing, right? I'll say value squared is one, or one over two pi. So we know nothing but the momentum. You also see a very nice symmetry that the, the functions just switch place, right? This one is like this one. And this one is like this one, same form. Let's just make a table to summarize. This is a table that you should have on your first page uh, in, in, in your book, in your, um, your, in your notes. You can always come back to it and position. You can always come back to it and use it. So the columns will be operator position space, momentum space. And I'll split up. Um, so we're going to talk two operators. We're going to talk the x operator and about the momentum operator. And I'll split up into the action and the eigenfunction. Like so. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything here. I'm just going to summarize what we found up till here. So in position space, right, this is x space and this is k space. The action of the position operator in x space is just multiplication by x. And the eigenfunction is a delta. And the action of the momentum operator is the derivative up to some uh, number. And the eigenfunctions are 1 over root 2 pi e to the i k naught x. Now, 
Now we have shown, actually I'm going to say something new, uh, but we have shown um, that the eigenfunctions of, right, the Fourier's form of this, we just did that. So the eigenfunctions of the momentum, op of the position operator in momentum space is e to the k x naught. I think there's a minus there, right? Wait a minute. Sorry. Did I do? What did I do? I'm stupid. Let's, get, let's go back. Well, you, should, you guys are asleep. What, 20 people? I'm sorry, I confused you. I take the Fourier transform of this. I, I confused you. You should scribble it out. Fourier transform of this is so the Fourier transform of x minus x naught. Right? And now the Fourier transform means use i k minus i k x dx. Right? I put the wrong argument beforehand. Big mistake. Don't learn from me. Um, now that's 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus i k x naught. Right? K is the variable. Uh, kind of a k naught here. K is the variable. And x naught is the quantum number. I'm uh, very sorry for the mistake. I already realized that this is the function we're transforming. So this is correct. Yeah. It's the quantum number. Um, the eigenfunction here, um, I think I'm not correct. Yeah, that one's correct. That's a delta k minus k naught. Um, now I'll tell you the action of the operators in k space. Um, very surprisingly, this is just minus i h bar derivative over p. Remember that here, p or k, if you want, it's just minus i d d k without an h bar. So in k space, the derivative is over k, because that's the variable. All the functions are expressed as a function of k. So I take the derivative with respect to k. Makes total sense. And here I just multiply by p. So in, in uh, momentum space, the momentum operator is multiplication by p. So you see again how this looks like this and this looks like this. It's a perfect analogy. And of course it makes sense to the Fourier transform of each other. Questions about this? Your question before transform here, right? So, if so we have a particle in state K in, in a momentum eigenstate, K naught. So, what's momentum? Okay. It's part K naught, right? Yeah. With absolute certainty. Could it be anything else? No way, right? So, you know with absolute certainty that the momentum is H part K naught. What is its position? No idea. No idea, right? Because the absolute value is square of this, this is a constant. Now, you see the fact that you know exactly what momentum is by taking the Fourier transform. In, in K space, in momentum space, the eigenfunction is a delta function centered at K naught. So you know that it is either zero or if K equals K naught, it's whatever, not infinite, but you know what I mean? And the same thing, what opposite goes with the second factor? Correct. Correct. Quantum mechanics is beautiful if you know what you're doing. Not what you're doing, if you do not know what you're doing, it's very frustrating. So I recommend that you be among the first. That always helps. OK, uh, expectation values. Expectation values. Now we come back to us in the beginning. This is what we compare to, um, to experiment. Expectation values, also known as uh, average or mean value. Uh, mean value.
that's the average mean value. I use all words mixed up to just remember all three. Um, all three words. Okay, so for a so it's something observable, okay? An observable F. Do we associate an operator F up, F in here? We now define the expectation value. Average, say the average momentum, right? This is the symbol. It's the average of F, where F is some physical quantity, is by definition, um, first of all, I'll choose another symbol. We can also write this as psi F operator psi. And this means, when I write this symbol, what do I mean? I mean, do the integral minus infinity to infinity, take the compass conjugate of psi. Um, of x and t, and then apply the operator on psi. This is a function of t. So the average, the average could change as a function of time. The average position of a particle could change as a function of time. But the average position is defined, or the average f, right, I'll get more specific in a moment, uh, is taking the integral psi star operator acting on psi, integral dx. Just give me a second. Um, now, why is this important? We saw that right, we do not know anything with absolute certainty under normal conditions. We don't know what a particle is. It's from distribution, say a Gaussian distribution. Uh, so if we measure the particle a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times, we can then look at where's the average posi position where I measure the particle. And then this average position can be compared to what I calculated here. So this I can compare to experiment. Question? Why wrote the psi twice? Excuse me? Why wrote the psi twice before the operator and after the operator? This is a symbol, OK? It's because I, I saw uh, the professor wrote the uh, one. Not for average. The average of f, of the quantity f, of the, of the observable f, is it's like in here, right? You have a psi star, that's this part. The operator, that's the middle, times psi, that's this. And then these brackets mean integrate over so dx. Every time the first one is the uh, compressed Yeah. Yes. Well, we're going to introduce this uh, notation in, in more depth one to come, but I'll just want to look to see the to see it now already. So you won't be something totally weird and new when we get there. Uh, it's notation new. It's just now that this is the way we, we symbolize an, an average value, um, it's sort of like the inner product that we talked about two weeks ago, but now I'm putting an operator in the middle. Right? If f operator equals one, it's just the inner product, which, which is a delta function in case of, in case of eigenvalues, really, right? To an example, let's talk about a free particle wave packet. Wave packet. So, a uh, wave packet is the word it means that instead of having e to the ikx, we have some uh, distribution. Be a Gaussian, but today we want to a Gaussian with something new. This function e to the minus a absolute value of x. So this looks like this. And there's a peak here. Then it goes. It's e to the e to the x here, e to the minus x on this side, and here in the middle it equals to a. Um, so this is a wave packet, and now we want to find the expectation values. The expectation values. 
um, x squared p and p squared. So it's the first moment of x, the second moment of x, of x the first moment of p, and the second moment of p. The average of p squared is the second moment of p. Um, then compute the expectation value of the kinetic energy. This is the kinetic energy. Okay, so how is this done? Just go over the formula. X, it's just integral dx psi star. Right, it's psi star x operator psi. So in our case, psi star and psi are exactly the same. They're real functions. Uh, we get an a squared outside. And then there's an integral dx. dx operator, we're working in x space. Right, so we can go to our table, position space. x over is multiplication by x. That's right on the first page. You always need it. Um, e to the minus 2a absolute value of x. Um, this is a simple integral. Do not say regression by part. We will need to write answer, but do not say it. We have to separate it to negative and positive values. Much easier. It's an even function, the opposite. Uh, right? It's an odd function. It's an odd function because e to the minus this or e to the e to the minus absolute value of x is an even function. X is an odd function. So odd times even is odd. Integral over symmetric boundaries of an odd function. Right? The area on the left hand side is equal to the area on the right hand side, you automatically get zero. Is that clear? You can go the hard way and separate this into two parts and integration by parts and work very hard, you'll get there. But you work like 10 times as hard. Or infinite amount of times of how goes zero, have zero work, so 10 times zero is still zero, right? So looking at a function before you do an integral is always helpful. Um, why does it make sense? The graph, yes. Take the absolute value squared of this, right? Like you see the distribution in x space. What is the average of this distribution? Square, but it looks the same. It's the middle, x equals zero. Makes total sense. So you just love it when stuff makes sense. Okay, let's go to the mean position square. I think I'll switch to the mean position square. We have to do the same. And now the integral will be a little bit more difficult to solve. moment, uh, the rule of the second moment tells you something about the width of the function. In case of a Gaussian, the second moment is just sigma, the standard deviation. It's not a Gaussian, so it's, you can't really define a sigma here, maybe you can, I'm not a mathematician, but it tells you about the width. The larger the second moment is, the wider the function is. Variance. It's the variance. It's the variance. Oh. Right, so it's not the variance, it's the second moment. <laughs> okay. <It's laughs> no, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. You're right, you're correct, you're right, you're right. You have to take away. The variance is, is the second moment minus the first moment squared. So inside the variance, okay, you understand me. Um, so we're looking for the expectation value of x squared, which by definition, right, it's psi x operator squared psi. X operator is multiplication by x, so x squared means do the, do the operation of x and then do it again. 
So you're multiplying by x and multiplying by x again. So what are you doing? You're multiplying by x squared. It's really stupid. Um, it's really simple. So it's uh, a squared integral, and then we take x squared, and then we have e to the minus 2ax, right? Now, I will not bore you to death with a five-line derivation of the integral, OK? So you stay awake. But what you have to do here is obvious. You need to split it in two parts. You don't need to in two parts. Let me, I'll show you the, the key point. It's an even function. So, it's, so the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity is twice the integral from 0 to infinity, right? And now, since we're only going from 0 to infinity, x is strictly positive, we can just lose the absolute value. So there's no need uh, to split the integral into two parts and, and, and do it twice. You do the work once. Okay? Thinking always helps you save work. In this case, you still have to work. This has to be evaluated by integration by parts. So it will work a little bit. Uh, the boundary terms will always go because either there's an e to the minus infinity, which is 0, or there's an x, which an x equals 0 is 0. Right? So the boundary terms will always go away. Um, but you still have to do integration by parts twice. But I'm sure you're up to that. If not, then you shouldn't be in second year, you should be in first year. So I hope everyone's up to this. You're up to this, right? I believe in you. So you get that x squared equals a squared over 2 alpha to the third. Alpha, that should be an A, right? Yeah, that should be an A. Don't ask me why that became an alpha prop suddenly. Oh, it always was an alpha. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I thought if I had typed my notes, I would be able to read my handwriting, but it doesn't help. Um, OK, so just do integration by parts twice. Uh, you, you'll get there. I, I'm sure you, you'll manage. Um, so that's that. Now let's go on. Let's do the momentum What am I doing here? OK, so I'll, I'll leave this. You know, I'll go back to the first board. I'll leave the table, because now we're going to do a trick. Um, the way you calculate the, 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 the expectation value of the momentum. So one way of doing it one way of doing it uh, is you know just follow the formula, say that first option is to follow the formula, piece Station value is integral minus infinity to infinity. Uh, there'll be an a squared outside. Um, and now there's e to the minus a x minus i h bar d dx e to the minus a x. I need to first take the derivative of psi, then multiply by psi star, which is just psi because it's real, and then integrate. I have to work hard, right? It's derivative and integral. In this case, it's an easy function, so that's an absolute value you have to care about. Um, that's one option. The second option, which is the one we're going to do, exactly, go to momentum space. So here you have to work hard once, because you have to Fourier transform your, your wave function. But after you've done that, your p operator will just be multiplication by p. So you work hard once instead of twice. Uh, so use Fourier transform. Fourier transform. So let's do it. Anyone remember what the Fourier transform of this function is? So the mention. Not going to do it. You did it at home. So in case you didn't copy from anybody else, you even know how to do it? Well, I hope you remember what you did two weeks ago. If not, do it again. You know what makes a master, right? 
practice makes a master. So we take the Fourier transform of psi, um, and we get a over root two pi, two alpha, two a, sorry. Start with a, let's stay with a. a squared plus k squared. So the in k. OK. Now, right, that's the reason we did it. P operator, let's choose a multiplication by P, which makes it very simple to go. Average value of P is, right, it's, it's H bar times the average value of K. Um, so there's an H bar, and then there's normalization from here, which gets squared, integral minus infinity to infinity, 2 alpha over alpha squared plus k squared squared, right? That's the sine to psi star. There's multiplication by k and integral dk. Now you're masters of this. It's obviously equals zero because an even function times an odd function, symmetric boundaries equals zero. It's very repetitive. Also here, it makes total sense. A Laurentian, I didn't draw it for you, but you know that a Laurentian is a symmetric function. It's like a Gaussian, but wider with longer tails, not necessarily wider, but has longer tails, doesn't fall, fall off as fast. Um, a what function? A Laurentian. I'm never sure if there's a T there or not. There are two physicists, one Lawrence with a T, one Lawrence without a T. One is the guy from electricity, the other is the guy from special relativity. Two different people, same name, different to the T. Uh, so this is called Laurentian, Laurentian function. Uh, it is a symmetric function around K. Um, so obviously, <coughs> its mean, uh, the mean momentum is zero. That was easy. Um, P squared. Um, so we now have to solve the, inter the same integral, but with K squared, right? It's exactly the same formula. Um, this is a difficult um, integral. Uh, in order to solve it, you need something called complex analysis, which you'll be learning next semester. So for now, just take it as a given uh, formula that this equals that this equals h bar squared a squared <coughs> times a, and my alphas are of course a's. So uh, you don't have a solution to react, don't, don't be disturbed by it. You took a computer, you plugged in the world from alpha, it gave you this. You do not know how, you not need to know how to solve this yet. But next year, there will be no excuses. Next semester. Okay? Now we want to find, that was the first part, right? We want to find, so we found the, the, the mean value of x, of x squared, of p, and of p squared. Now I want to know the mean value of the kinetic energy. But that is now just simple. Why is that? Exactly. The mean value of the potential energy. So what is the potential energy? It's the momentum squared divided by 2m, right? What is t? What is the kinetic energy? It's the mean value of p squared over 2m. Now, the mean value of 1 over 2m is just a number, so it's 1 over 2m. And the mean value of p squared. What is the mean value of p squared? Look at this. I just did it. So it's really simple. That's just h plus squared a squared a divided by 2m. There you go. No need to do the derivative again. Do not write think. My main point. It's very helpful to think. Okay, questions? Still digesting. Excuse me? Still digesting. Digesting? This was simple. Everything else was. 
It really was, I agree. We'll see, it's not that hard, I promise. Okay, last topic for today, uncertainty principle. I already introduced the idea of uncertainty. Now let's put a formula to, a formula to it. This goes back to Heisenberg, one of the, one of the main uh, quantum mechanics physicists, one of the inventors of quantum mechanics, um, the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. We define, first of all, the uncertainty in position delta x, that means on, right, the uncertainty, it's the square root of the second moment minus the first moment squared. So it's a standard deviation. It's a standard deviation of the, from the mean value. The uncertainty in momentum is the same thing. Second moment minus first moment. Now the uncertainty principle says one of the postulates of quantum actually can be proven as well mathematically, but you can think about the postulate, it says that the the um, the product of the uncertainty in x and the uncertainty in p, so delta x times delta p, must be larger or equal to h bar divided by two. Excuse me? No, it's two. H divided by two. One hundred percent. No, I'm certain that the uncertainty is h over two. <laughs> it's larger or equal to. One hundred percent. Let's make a box. Now it's official. Okay. Um, this is the uncertainty principle. Sometimes people say that delta x delta p goes like h bar. So then you're around. You know, that's the the order of magnitude. This is the exact expression. We can prove mathematically using something called the Schwartz inequality. Uh, if you don't know what it is, then it doesn't matter. I don't really know myself. Um, I do know what it is, but it's not that important. We'll just take the postulate. Um, this is the uncertainty principle. Um, that's sort of an example for the wave packet. Um, that we just talked about, the same one. Uh, find or show that the principle is satisfied. Show that the uncertainty principle principle is satisfied. So this would be a lot of work. But we have already calculated all of these things. So delta x, in our case, uh, the mean x is just 0. So it's the root of the second moment, because the mean value is 0. Right? We did that. So if you plug in, it's gone. But if you plug it in, um, it is a over root of 2a to the third. And in the same way, delta p is just the square root of the second moment of the momentum. That is h bar a times root a. That's why an alpha, because now a and a is kind of confusing when I say it. One's capital, one's capital, one's small. OK, so uh, that's the uncertainty in, in x, the standard deviation, um, or the width um, of, the, of the of the wave function x space. This is the width of the wave function um, in k space. Okay, um, and now the product delta x delta p is a squared h bar over root two a. Right? 
not correct. What about the H bar? Ah, that's the H bar there. Okay. Um, now, this doesn't say anything. I cannot compare it to this yet because I have two unknowns, both A, both capital A and, and little a. So what I have to do is find one and express it as a function of the other. Uh, of course, that is not difficult. How would you do that? Excuse me? Exactly. Exactly. Use normalization uh, condition. Very good. So let's do so. Let's do so. By definition, 1 equals a squared integral e to the minus 2ax minus infinity plus infinity dx. Simple integration, we get um, a squared over alpha over a. But, uh, it's the same trick. It's twice the integral from 0 to infinity. And then the integral is just divided by 2a, so the 2 disappears. Right from a downstairs. Um, so we get from here that a squared equals a. Plug it back in. So a squared and a just cancel each other. Delta x delta p equals h bar over root 2. Is this satisfied? It is. Because right, 1 divided by root 2 is larger than 1 divided by 2. Because root 2 is smaller than 2. So 1 divided by is larger. So we see that it is satisfied. It is not equal to h bar over 2. So the uncertainty is not minimal. It means that if we worked harder, if we used a different wave function maybe, then we could make the uncertainty lower. We're not working at the minimum, um, but it's satisfied. Um, you will see, and with this I'll end, you will see in your homework, I'm just going to mention it now, it will be in your homework, you will see that if, if for a Gaussian wave packet, so if psi of x is a Gaussian, um, then you will find that the uncertainty is minimal. You'll find delta x, delta p exactly equals h bar over 2. And you'll be doing your homework, uh, so you'll see that it depends, depends what your wave function is, uh, the uncertainty can be changed. It could be large, it could be smaller. This is just a bottom limit. The lower limit, the lower limit, is, the lower limit is, is achieved by a Gaussian, and that's one of the reasons we love Gaussians, because it's the most quantum mechanical it could be, because the uncertainty is minimal. For, for a function where the, where the x space is a uh, e to the minus ax, and the k space is a Laurentian, the uncertainty is small, but not minimal. Questions about this? OK, so now you're ready to do quantum mechanics. How do you feel? Tired? Yeah, me too. Uh, OK, so see you next week.